Welcome everyone for some virtual fireside stories for the climate for three of Canada's icons. My name is Toby Heaps. I'm with Corporate Knights, and I would like to thank um, all of our partners for this event, especially the embassies of the Federal Republic of Germany, France, and the British High Commission. It has become customary at events such as these to do a formal land acknowledgement, but tonight in the spirit of action that we'll be discussing, Instead, I would like to invite uh, everyone who's with us tonight who has control over some budget to consider spending 5% of that budget with Indigenous businesses in line with the portion of our population that Indigenous people represent. Before we get underway, we are going to show a 90 second video depicting the cleaner, more prosperous Canada that we could have by 2030 if we start to take bold action today. Companies flying the maple leaf have proven that a new economic formula can power prosperity while protecting the planet. It started when our largest investors, led by pension funds and real estate, redirected their capital to power a green renovation wave. It made our homes and workplaces more comfortable and cheaper to run, built out the electricity transmission and charging networks needed to electrify the economy all the while earning attractive returns for Canadian pensioners. We reimagined our resource industry to become the global suppliers of choice for lightweight carbon fibers, clean hydrogen, low carbon economy materials, and renewable jet fuels. Our rich mineral deposits and petrochemical industry produced billions of batteries to become the leading manufacturer of state-of-the-art zero emission trucks and buses. Using low-carbon methods free of expensive inputs, farmers and food suppliers blend the best tradition of our ancestors with modern technology to nourish people and the planet. Millions of hectares of green forests were planted and protected in partnership with indigenous forest guardians, creating a new set of lungs and fresh air for the planet. The Maple Leaf economic model is now taught in schools around the world, and all it took was investing a little less than 1% of our GDP, working with provinces and municipalities to keep the momentum going. To those who made it possible. So when, when I watch this video, I'm inspired and I'm also appreciative of the many beautiful minds across Canada who helped put together the analysis on which the video is based, including Ralph Torrey and, and Celine Back. I was also blown away with how affordable it is to get ourselves off the track that we are on right now and onto this more sustainable, cleaner, more prosperous track at just 1% of GDP per year redirected by the federal government to catalyze many, many more dollars. But many others feel differently. If YouTube comments are any indicator, and I hope they're not a broad indicator of, of where humanity is at, the YouTube comments on this video are universally negative. Um, mostly people saying it's a takeover of their private property, a big government scam. And there's a lot of people who are mistrustful and have lost their faith in the body politic. And they see bold proposals such as these as some kind of plot to enrich the few at the expense of the many. The people at the top are also part of the problem and a barrier to boldness. Is most are married to the status quo, which has served them quite well, and too wary of getting out of their comfort zones. But as Bob Dylan said, the times, they are changing. Tesla is one example. Once a small cap stock is now worth triple ExxonMobil, while solar power prices have come down 
89% in the last 10 years and are cheaper in many places than coal or gas or any other form of energy. The climate solutions at an economic level are now growing faster than the problems. The solutions are growing faster than the problems. Many of our trading partners see where the puck is going and they are skating hard in the direction of a cleaner carbon-free economy. So the question for Canada for us is, are we going to lead this change or are we going to follow it? We have the money, the people, the resources, the know-how, but do we have the will? If enough people believe it's possible to create a thriving economy in sync with nature and do the hard, uncomfortable work to make it possible, I believe it will happen. Our hope is tonight's event is a punctuation mark in that direction. We are lucky to have some really special storytellers with us tonight, three of Canada's most beautiful minds. We have with us Sheila Watkluche, who's a Nobel Peace Prize nominee, UN, UN Environment Champion, and a champion Inuit activist who has helped to connect the trials and tribulations of the North to millions of people across the world. We have David Suzuki, who many of us have grown up on and had our initial passions aroused for nature through his, his powerful broadcasts over many decades. And we have with us, of course, Margaret Atwood, novelist, poet, literary critic, and also an environmental activist. But she once said in, a, in, a, in remarks, I'm of course not a real activist. I'm simply a writer without a job who is frequently asked to speak about subjects that would get people with jobs fired if they themselves spoke. Um, so uh, we have a pretty lucky lineup with us tonight to, um, to explore some of these important questions. We also have two guides, moderators, uh, Adria Vassell, who is the managing editor of Corporate Nights and also the author of the Ecoholic book series. And we have with us Adam Radwanski, who helps to interpret climate change through the prisons of power and economics is the columnist and future writer at the Globe and Mail. So without further ado, I'd like to dish it over to Adria and let the discussion begin. Thank you kindly. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, David, Sheila, Margaret, for being with us tonight. It's uh, such an honor to have you here to join this conversation. This fireside chat uh, doesn't quite have a fire, but uh, we were thinking of having one in one of the Hollywood squares here. It, <laughs> uh, but what, we wanted to make this concept a bit more intimate for people, because for a lot of Canadians, a lot of people around the world, climate change is still an abstract concept that they don't immediately re relate to. And I was wondering if you could tell us, why does the climate crisis hit home for you? And I thought we'd start with you, Sheila. Yes, good evening. <laughs> and good evening to all the Canadians. Thanks for having me here. Uh, well, I mean, this, the, I have been telling this story for the last, I would say, almost 20, 25 years now in terms of the importance of the environment as it relates to us, uh, Inuit of the Arctic. And certainly uh, for us, it's about, you know, the, the ice, the snow and uh, the cold. It represents a life force for us. We are people who rely upon that snow and that ice to travel. So for us, it's always been about transportation and mobility. And when climate change starts to happen, the warming starts to happen and creates havoc for us, then it becomes an issue of safety and security first and foremost. And it's not just about the actual uh, harvest and the hunt that we do for our wonderful organic nutritious food for our families and our communities, but it's also what the land and the environment and teaches us and prepares our children for the opportunities and challenges of life. So it's, it's about humanizing this issue of climate change. And that's been the main, um, I guess, passion and purpose of, of my work over the past couple of decades is to try to humanize these issues that have been so, you know, um, depicted as only politics or economics or science. And for us, it's about our communities that are trying to uh, maintain a way of life that works for us and it works well for us and it has always worked well for us so it really is about our children and our communities and uh, yeah if you don't mind just unpacking for us a little bit uh how our, our fossil fuel emissions in the south are really already starting to change life for you in the north mm -hmm. 
Yes, for the past 15 years or so, if, if not a little bit more, the changes have been really dramatic. In some areas, it's, it's much more dramatic. For example, in Alaska, uh, you just have to Google some of the communities there and their homes are already falling into the sea on the coast uh, due to the coastal erosion and the permafrost. Our runways, even in Nunavik and some of our homes in Sudluit, for example, are buckling and have to be moved and the runways have to be repaved uh, more frequent than they used to be because of the buckling that's happening. Um, and, and the ice is forming much later in the fall and breaking up earlier in the spring, uh, making it a, a shorter period of time to be on that ice. And the conditions are very different in the sense that the ice is freezing differently. So it's harder to read the conditions uh, because the, the waters are much warmer underneath. So the ice forms different and it's harder to have traditional knowledge be real in many situations now as a result of that. So the safety issue kicks in all the time and there's a lot more accidents as a result. New species of birds and, and fish and, and uh, uh, you know, other, other things that are happening. And, that, and I've just moved back to my hometown. I've lived in Nunavut for 20 years. I moved back to Nunavik and uh, I hadn't been living there for a long time. And you should see the growth of the, uh, the trees and the willows now, which it, it's become almost a lush landscape, which is very different from, the, uh, from when I left and, and from the time I was a child. And we have these high, uh, also very high uh, temperature in the summertime. The weather has, can jump up into the 30s now, but unlike before. And the river that I, we, we were never allowed to go beside when I was a child, uh, on hot days, there's whole, the whole community goes down and spends the day at the beach now on that river. So things, uh, lots of changes, lots. Thank you for painting that picture for us. Uh, the impacts already devastating uh, in the North, at many places around the world. But for David, what is it about the climate crisis that keeps you up at night? Oh, how did you know I don't sleep anymore? <laughs> I had a hunch. Well, the, you know, the frustrating thing to me is that, that uh, I've spent my entire uh, adult career trying to get people to take science seriously. I went into, bro I'm, I was a scientist. I accidentally went into broadcasting because I realized how scientifically illiterate North Americans were, and television gave me an opportunity to try to, to make science accessible because I feel, I felt, how could we uh, make important decisions in our lives if we aren't scientifically literate and take science seriously? So seeing the state, you know, I'm seeing a total failure of, uh, of what I had hoped to accomplish. Uh, you know, like when you when you see what's going on in the United States, the science denialism is just terrifying to me. But I just wanted to give your audience a reminder and what makes me really uh, despair. In 1965, an American uh, uh, named Frank Eichard said in a public speech, and I quote, there is still time to save the world's people from the catastrophic consequence of pollution. But time is running out. Carbon dioxide is being added to Earth's atmosphere by the burning of coal, oil, and natural gas at such a rate that by the year 2000, the heat balance will be so modified as possibly to cause changes in climate beyond local or even national efforts. This is 1965. Frank Eichard was the president of the American Petroleum Industry um, or, or Institute. That's the American equivalent of CAP, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. So in 1965, the industry knew damn well what was going on. By the 1970s, James Black, a lead scientist for Exxon reported, and I quote, there is general scientific agreement that the most likely manner in which mankind is influencing the global climate is through carbon dioxide release from the burning of fossil fuels. This is an Exxon scientist. And yet by 1998, the American petroleum industry's position, which Frank Eichard had said in 65, and their position now is, and quote, it's not known for sure whether A, climate change is actually occurring 
and B, if it is, whether humans really have an influence on it. So there you go. There's the dilemma. And how, for you, in your personal life, has that experience felt to see all this inaction on an issue that's so catastrophic? Well, I mean, I've, I've met with so many of our, our so-called leaders and, uh, uh, you know, when Jean Chrétien ratified the Kyoto Protocol, he sent me a letter saying that I and our foundation had made him, uh, uh, made it possible for him. Uh, Paul Martin, uh, we got a person, uh, David Boyd, to go and actually spend a year in, in his Privy Council advising on sustainability within a generation, which was a a program that uh, my foundation had uh, written up. And so, you know, we've had the uh, appearance that people get it. Mm. Um, but the frustration, of course, is that uh, Canada's record on any of these kinds of uh, promises they've made is abysmal. We have never met a single tar target or promise that we've made in the past. So, uh, And David, how does that hit home for you when you look at your granddaughters who were recently born? Well, I, uh, you know, one of the questions that I knew was going to be asked is what, what would I like to see uh, for my children or grandchildren when they reach my age? What would they look at? My grandchildren don't have a chance in hell of reaching my age. I'm 84, going on 85. And there's just no way that we can avoid. We've already started an experiment that is out of our control and with only a one degree rise above pre-industrial levels, all the hell is breaking loose. Just that's what Sheila's talking about for heaven's mm -hmm. sakes. I mean, I just saw in the Guardian today, there was a, a, a sped up picture of what's happening to the ice in the Arctic over a year. It's horrifying to see that that ice is just gone. You know, in a year, that cycle is gone. And Mikhail Badiko, a climatologist from Russia in 1960, in his textbook, said if we lose the ice sheet in the Arctic, and that is probably going to happen, there will be an acceleration of the, of the warming because we will lose the, uh, the reflective uh, effect of uh, ice, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the heat that's coming on. He predicted exactly what's happening now. So... Um, you know, the tragedy to me is, if you look back on our history as a species, we evolved in Africa 150,000 years ago. We were just a furless ape on the, the Great Plains of Africa. We didn't have anything going for us. We weren't big. We weren't fast. We weren't strong. The only thing that we had that was a big advantage was, was hidden. It was the human brain. And it conferred on us, of course, a curiosity, observation, uh, inventiveness, but it had a big memory. And we learned, we invented an idea called the future. And because we invented the concept of a future, we realized we can affect the future by what we do today. Calling on our memory and our observations, we could see if I go that way, I ran into a saber-toothed tiger, but when I went that way, I found something good to eat. So I'm going that way. Foresight was our great advantage over all the other creatures. Mm -hmm. And now we've got all of the amplified foresight of scientists and supercomputers. And they've been warning us for over 50 years that we're changing the chemistry of the atmosphere, that we've got to do something. And that the frightening thing to me is that we're no longer paying attention to that quality that got us to where we are. Look ahead, see where the dangers are, see where opportunities lie, and then choose to avoid danger and exploit opportunity. We're turning our backs on the very survival strategy of our species. We're going to get to how we work at breaking up that uh, climate inertia and, and tapping into that foresight that you mentioned. Uh, but first, Margaret, how does the climate crisis hit home for you? Well, I grew up with the biologists and also the early environmentalists who in those days were just viewed as harmless cranks. Mm. Um, so I have seen the conversation move from the margins to the center. You know, people are aware of the 
climate crisis, pro or con, they're, they're aware that there is a conversation going on, which back in the 50s, they were not. Um, so that's, I think I'm even, am I older than David? No, not quite. Um, but <laughs> I'm older than your TV show. Um, <laughs> so the dinner table conversation at our house in 1955 was we're all going to be burped to death by the methane coming out of cows. So people were, you know, they were talking about pesticides. They were talking, the biologists had a slightly different take um, from that of the climatologists, but same subject. So extinction was being talked about then and uh, conservation was being talked about then and changing climate was being talked about then. And out came the Club of Rome in 1972, David, uh, saying much the same thing. If we keep going down this path, uh, horrible things will happen. If we go down this other path, um, it's, it's going to be better. But again, we did not go down the preferable path. And now, uh, and each time we've missed that turnoff, the um, possibilities of rectifying our course have become harder. So let me sum it up in a nutshell. Back me up here, David. If we warm the ocean above a certain temperature and kill the marine algaes, the northern marine algaes, we're going to choke to death because that's what makes uh, a large percentage of our oxygen. It was not originally an oxygen atmosphere on Earth. It was a methane atmosphere, and it was these um, uh, marine algaes that over many, 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 many years formed the oxygen atmosphere and, and they continue to do so. So that's the biggie. You can talk about forest fires and, you know, heat strokes and, and what have you on land. But if we don't have enough oxygen, that's it. Sure. Cockroaches will probably be okay. They're a smaller life form. We are a medium sized uh, oxygen breathing mammal. And um, that's what we need. Every time you take a breath, you're breathing nature. It's not something out there, it's something inside your body. So I think I'm on the pessimism score, David. Do you think I win? <laughs> <laughs> the big question is do you want to be a species? Mm. If you don't, fine. Keep doing what you're doing. If you want to continue as a species on this planet, you better give it some serious thought. The problem, Margaret, is that we are a species as there's never been. We have taken over the planet, but we've diversified so much in terms of our cultures and our sense of where we're belonging and our priorities that it's hard for us to act as a single species. And that is, why is true. In my, but, in but, my but, essay, but, the only time you see that happen is when we're invaded from outer space. Then, then we suddenly come together. But, That's uh, movies, David. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we like those movies. They're very comforting. Um, so yes, but, um, but it doesn't matter how diversified we have become. If we run out of oxygen to breathe, that's it for everybody. Mm -hmm. Margaret, we know you're the reigning queen when it comes to imagining dystopias of the future. If you were to write, uh, well, maybe not utopian, but anti-dystopian climate novel, um, what would you hope the world might look like when your grandchildren are adults? Okay, so here, there is a recipe for this already. It's um, a website called Project Drawdown. Mm. And the book that goes with it is called Drawdown, but they keep updating the website. And on this website, they tell us about all of the things we are currently doing. This doesn't require any new in, in, inventions. The things we are currently doing that if we did them more would result in a net drawdown of carbon from the atmosphere by 2050, which isn't soon enough. So I think they should readjust that to make it sooner. Uh, but they've got the money, you know, this is how much it would cost. This is how much the return would be. And um, here's what it would take and here's why it would work. And they've got those things in the energy sector, in the education sector, 
in the agricultural sector, um, in forestry, in all of these different um, sectors, they've got what we could do better, what we could do more of, which would cause a drawdown of carbon from the atmosphere. Mm. So that is the recipe. And um, you can, you, I remember all those drawings in the 30s of what the future was going to look like. Guess what? It didn't. Uh, so you, you can you can make these plans. It's never going to be quite like that because there isn't one the future. There are an infinite number of possible futures, and we don't know quite which one we're going to end up at. But David is quite right that whatever it looks like, um, unless we start acting on the idea that there will be a future uh, for the human race, it ain't going to happen. Sheila, in your article that you wrote, it's currently on our website, if, if anyone's looking to read it, you talked about the importance of imagination right now. You write that we need to imagine that we can do things differently. Now, if Canada were to get its act together and you get everything on your climate wish list, what do you imagine the world might look like when your grandchildren grow up? Well, I, I think I'm a, I, I may be a little more optimistic than, <laughs> than what has been said a few moments ago, but let me, let, let me explain why. Uh, you know, I, I'm from a culture that is still very dependent and reliant on the environment and our climate for our food source. So every day that I'm home in Nunavik or whether I, when I was living in Nunavut, you, I witness and I continue to witness everybody going out on that land into nature to get our wonderful food on, the, on our plates. And, and also spending time out there in nature, ice fishing in the winter, hunting, and in the summertime, berry picking, gathering our berries in the summer. And, and there's still a lot of wonderful, you know, as much as the message that I give is that you know, we've got to do something about what's happening to our ice conditions and all the changes that are happening. There is still this remarkable way in which we live that is very positive and hopeful because of how we live every day out there as Indigenous people. And, and so, and also the fact that when I am on the speaking circuit, I did it certainly until COVID hit, um, you know, uh, out there in person talking to audiences, I found the hope in the audiences that I speak to in, the, in terms of how they were so open mm -hmm. to hearing and learning from the Indigenous perspectives on what does hunting mean. As I said earlier, it's not just about uh, the, the harvesting of animals, but it's what we learn about ourselves while we're out there, the character building that is, is taught to our children and, and, and how important that is with that connection that we have with nature and our environment. And so it has given me a lot of hope in talking to the audiences and, and seeing the youth rising to really make a stand on these issues. Because for us, we have lived these states of emergencies and these nightmares of you know, poverty and, and the colonialistic way in which that has really suppressed and oppressed us for decades upon decades. And so we're used to that kind of dark place that we live in, but what also always gives us that incredible encouragement and hope is our connection to our culture and the connection to nature and to our food source. And, and that continues to this very day. So I'm much more optimistic, I think, because I see the connections that are being made when, when I'm speaking to them, not just me, but there's many other indigenous peoples who are doing the same, who are also really um, in a place where you can see the lights going on. It's not to say that there's going to be monumental changes, but change happens at the speed of trust. And, and the speed of trust is, is an important piece here when it comes be, uh, to indigenous peoples and, and of our, our governance, our government, our, 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 our government, our, whether it's, you know, it's other societies. And it takes time and it has taken a lot of time because I mean, David has been working on these issues much longer than I have. But for me in the last 20 years, I have seen changes in attitudes because for me, and I say, I write this in, in my piece, it's about personal transformation that is going to change the way we 
treat each other. It's going to change how we change our attitudes. And that hopefully will translate into policy changes that are going to be really different from the way that my life, my, my generation has dealt with these issues. And for me, as I said, personal transformation, and I quote Marianne Williamson, as you know, personal transformation can and does have global effects. As we go, so goes the world, for the world is us. And the revolution that will save the world is ultimately a personal one. I really believe that. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that if we focus on Indigenous wisdom, that that is the medicine we seek in, in trying to create a a, sustain, a more of a sustainable world. And if we can invest the capital into uh, indigenous businesses, and I was very happy to, to hear Toby say that there's a percentage that's going to go to ind indigenous businesses, then that's, I think, going to be a remarkable way in which we can try different things in different ways. And rather than seeing indigenous peoples as victims to climate change and victims to all of the things that have happened in our world, uh, for going way back, as I say, let's tap into uh, creating and innovating Indigenous businesses that will help elevate those voices that know a thing or two about sustainability. And so it's a shift that we have to make in our own personal attitudes and approaches towards uh, each other and, uh, and in respecting and trying to get uh, ensure that the, the Indigenous communities are going to be on an equal footing in all of the talks that are given and all of the ways in which business is dealt with and how politics is run. Um, but I'll stop there, but there's more to say about some of the, you know, the, the COP meetings and so on. I'll jump in with a question here. Um, uh, David, I'll start with you, I think, on it. Uh, we, could, we could hear the, the frustration, I think, um, in, your, in, in, your, in your words so far. Um, and I, I can understand it having been on, you know, I've just been on the climate beat for about a year. And even in that time, um, although I've always obviously followed it before, I've been able to see, um, you know, the, the difficulty in getting sustained momentum and action on this. I mean, you know, in a year where we started off talking about, um, well, the start of the pandemic, at least about um, ambitious green recovery. And you've been able to see the government of Canada kind of wavering on that, even even in the last, you know, month by month. So I can understand the frustration of, of, um, of a career and a life spent spent fighting on these things. Uh, what I wonder there is, I mean, clearly, there, there must not be quite enough public pressure uh, on governments to move swiftly on this, or they would because they, they would have to. How do we change that how why why is there not enough public pressure somehow that compels uh governments to make this a focal point consistently uh, no matter what else is going on in, in their daily lives um and what can we do to make it make it that okay that's a really Im important question and i think fundamentally the the challenge the problem is the underlying values and beliefs that shape the way that we uh, act in, in the world. So, you know, for 95% of human existence, at least the story I get from science, is that human beings lived as nomadic hunter-gatherers. We had to carry everything we owned on our backs and follow the animals and plants through the seasons along migratory routes and all of that. When you live in that kind of a state, you know you are deeply embedded in the natural world, that your very survival and well-being depends on a web of relationships with other species, with air, water, the sun. That's what we call an ecocentric way of seeing our place. We're one strand in a very complex web. And in that web, there's an enormous responsibility. You have to act properly to ensure that that web uh, stays in place. And that's the way it was for most of human existence. Even after the agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago, in fact, we were still basically a farming uh, animal and farmers know very well that weather, climate, the seasons determine how you will do as a farmer. They know about pollination by insects and <coughs> nitrogen fixation by certain plants. They know snow in the winter is related to moisture in the soil in the summer. They understand we live in that ecocentric world. Now, I, I have a whole long speech about how the transition happened but as we settled down after the agricultural revolution, we then had to 
you know, develop religions to teach people how to behave properly. We had politicians and we had to have some kind of an economic system. But I believe that ever since the Industrial Revolution, we begun to think we aren't in that web of relationships. It's all about us. You see, we're so smart. We aren't constrained by any natural limits. We can travel faster than any bird or mammal that has ever been on the planet. We can lift enormous weights, move mountains. I mean, all of that through technology, we can see to the edge of the universe or discover a world of life in a drop of water with our microscopes. We now seem to have escaped the laws of nature. It's all up to us and our cleverness. And so the very systems within which we exist now are based on this kind of anthropocentrism. We see ourselves outside and above everything, and it's all a matter for us. So the environment, well, we just got to be a little more careful, that's all. But basically, if you look at our legal systems, our legal systems are great about defining property and human rights and all of that. But what about the right of a bird to live as it evolved to live an entire life or of a forest to exist as a community of organisms or of a river to flow as it has for thousands of years? Who the hell do we think we are that we're going to set all of these rights as if nature is something we, we're in charge of that and we're going to, uh, we're going to define its rights. And our economic system that we've developed now, first of all, it is such a screwed up system. I mean, we developed an economic system based on the, the creed of cancer cells, for God's sake. Cancer cells think they can grow forever and they'll kill you long before they become a very significant part of your body. Nothing in a finite world can grow indefinitely. So the idea that growth has become the very definition of progress of uh, our economic system is suicidal. And then we act as if nature is an externality. It's, you know, when you clear cut a forest and lose that forest and all of its ecosystem services, well, that's collateral damage. That's the price of progress. So our economic system, and this is why, you know, when I hear people uh, as in your video, you know, saying, well, you know, we, we just have to get the right economic indicators and, and we've got to have the market uh, acting. The, the whole system itself is fundamentally destructive because it's been driven by a sense that nature is simply in, there to serve our economy and that uh, growth forever is an aspiration. There are no limits to growth. And finally, we have a political system that is ridiculous. The most important uh, ones that are affected by political decisions now don't vote. And politicians must pay attention to voters. Well, children don't vote. Future generations don't even exist. They're not on the agenda. But then what about a tree? Or what about the ocean? Or what about uh, the, the, uh, a bird or a fish like they're profoundly affected by our political actions, but they don't have any say in what that politics is all about. So you wanna say how the change is going, we have to change fundamentally the way we see our place on the planet. And the great gift is what Sheila just said. There are people who have clung to that ecocentric way of seeing the world. We just don't understand it. And you know, if you look at the Mohawks, the Ganesatage in, in Montreal now, fighting for that tiny little forest in Oka. The Oka, you know, a few decades ago, they wanted to build a golf course. Now they want to build a condominium or, or whatever. And the Mohawks are saying, look, we have a responsibility to care for that land. It's not a matter of money or, or more territory. They have a responsibility and that's what they're acting. And that's what we have to learn from indigenous people around the world who fought to sustain their culture, their language and their land, because not only are they grateful for nature's abundance and generosity, they have a responsibility to care for it. And, and they, we have, a, thank God, there are still communities there that have clung to that ecocentric view that we've got to learn and acquire. Otherwise, it's all just incremental stuff that we're going to do here and there. And it's not getting us off 
the, the basic destructive path we're on. Well, Sheila, let me go to you then next, because I mean, you, as David said, you have, you know, you, you've spoken um, about some people who have, who have, um, you know, taken these things more seriously or made more in touch with these challenges. And I think you've had success as well um, in your career in, in humanizing these challenges and, and getting at least some broader um, buy-in from people as to the importance of tackling them. So how do, uh, how do we get more people uh, to take this seriously enough to put the pressure that's needed on on governments and others um, to take urgent action on it? Well, some of the work that I did uh, when I was elected with the Inuit Circumpolar Council, for example, on the persistent organic pollutants, as an example, uh, which are the toxins that ended up in the Arctic food chain and the bodies and the nursing milk of Inuit women, uh, just to, to as, as a real stark eye opener that we're all so very interconnected that these toxins can make their way up into the food chain of Inuit, far from the source of these uh, byproduct of industry and, uh, and pesticides. And the global negotiations that were quite um, successful were, su you know, the success there was because we were able to put a human face to these large issues and bring it down to, uh, to all of us. And that, it, you know, that whatever happens in the Arctic doesn't stay there and it, it's affecting and impacting everyone else in the world. And that same goes with climate change. Um, it's all very interrelated and interconnected. And it's not just about the Arctic. It's about how the Arctic, the melt of the Arctic is now impacting upon everybody else. And that's what I meant by, well, the POPs treaty was successful in, uh, in, in terms of we were able to influence that by putting the human face and that was helpful. But with climate change, it's a, it's a larger daunting task to try to get the human face on the map. And of course, the work that I did in pioneering and connecting climate change to human rights was one that allowed for that discourse to kind of change and make it a, a more of a human issue and a human rights issue rather than just one, as I said earlier, you know, politics or science. And so people, I think, relate to it a lot better when they realize it's also about them. You know, it's about their homes, it's about their livelihoods too. And it's interesting that I got busier by the minute when, uh, until COVID hit, because people of the South were, their livelihoods and lives were starting to get very impacted by the droughts and the fires and the floods and the hurricanes and so on. And they wanted to know more about the Arctic connection. And so when you get people to try to understand from that human perspective, that we're all interconnected and interrelated and that anything that happens in one part of the world has negative impacts on another. Uh, I find that when people can, you can bring it down to that human level, people are more willing to understand and want to know more. And so that's been that kind of uh, hopeful moments for me in, in those teaching moments when I bring those kinds of stories to the audiences that I speak to. And certainly, as I said, for us, it has been uh, a long time that we have been living these kinds of states of emergencies. And now people are, 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 are having those kinds of similar uh, traumas themselves. And, and to try to understand what's happening in the Arctic, it's not, it's not just some far away place uh, where we don't understand who these people are. There, there's a better understanding I have found in the last 10 years in particular with uh, the importance of what's happening in the Arctic and trying to get people to, to come to that common sense of common humanity uh, for all of us. And, and those are positive moments uh, that have encouraged me to continue uh, to do what I do. Well, that's encouraging to hear. Um... Margaret, let me go to you as well on this, if you want to jump in on it. Um, I mean, you've, you've obviously written very uh, authoritatively on, on human nature gone wrong in various forms. Um, why are we, again, to, to the same question, um, of why it's been challenging to get sort of collective momentum around this and how we change that? Um, and, and also, I suppose, how we, uh, how we do it in a way that brings everybody in. Um, you know, we've had, um, you know, we, we've seen in Canada and elsewhere, um, even on relatively mild climate action, if it inconveniences people or if they feel, and I, I shouldn't be too pejorative, I guess, about that, because if people feel as though it's adding to the strains in their lives or affecting their livelihoods, it tends to create a backlash or it can, and governments have to back away and things get slowed down. 
how do we break that cycle and how do we get people um, rallied around this collectively in a way where we're not, where it's not as divisive and where there is more collective momentum toward it? Okay, so working with BirdLife International, which is in 120 plus countries and is a ground up conservation organization and the oldest one in the world, um, what you have to do and the same can be said of Permian Global, which is um, Stephen Rumsey's outfit that regenerates um, degraded tropical rainforests as a carbon capture uh, mechanism. You have to make it a positive for the people on the ground. So you can't just say, all right, we're, we're going to turn your, your farm into a solar farm and you don't have a choice in that. Um, you, you have to get uh, buy-in from the people who actually live on the ground and you have to make it a plus for them. You have to say it will be better for you, your future, your future, you, <laughs> individual person. It will be better if you do plan A rather than plan B or nothing. Um, so you... I, I would say you, you almost have to create the green jobs first. Do we do enough of keeping those people in mind, do you think? I mean, in, in, in you know, I think probably most people watching this and all of us here certainly care deeply about this issue. Um, and, you know, as we talk about the importance of moving on it, it is tempting to view anybody who doesn't think it's important to move quickly as, as somebody who is regressive in their thinking or an obstacle. Do we need to do a better job of, 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 uh, of thinking about all those people who are affected by this action and, and how to bring them along? Absolutely. And uh, you wouldn't go into another country as a conservation organization and start, you know, talking down to people and uh, dismissing their concerns. Um, you, you have to make it okay for them. And a real model for that is another organization that I've got some connection with, which is the National Eye Maasai Conservancy. Um, it's, it's in Africa. And they got buy-in from all the sheep and goat farmers in their, in their area for what they were doing. And they made it a positive for them. So they said, Let, let's take down the fences and let the animals vote with their feet. And that happened. And it's been a huge conservation success. But in order to do that, they had to say to everybody who has had some goats and sheep, OK, should a lion eat one of yours, we'll replace it. You know, you have to make it a plus. You have to. And they, they had to sort of pay lease money to the to the people that they wanted to have agree with them. Um, so, so you have to make it good for the people on the ground, or it's, or it's really not going to happen. You're going to get too much pushback and, uh, and anger. It sounds like we need to allocate some money for a just transition to support, whether it's uh, the Maasai moving away from their practices that were destructive to that's right. Canadians that are yeah, well, all, all sorts of jobs have gone obsolete over the course of even um, the last hundred years. There used to be milkmen, they had wagons, they had horses. Uh, houses used to have milk boxes in them. The milk bottles were put into the milk box. It was a nifty way of getting into the house if you forgot your key. Um, and, uh, so, so all you know, the coal guy, the coal truck used to come, and people had coal chutes, and all this coal would come down, and you have to shovel it into the furnace. So I can remember all of that, and go back a few more decades. People who had, uh, who had careers in horses, you know, blacksmiths who used to put horseshoes on horses. There used to be a lot of them. Where are they now? Wheelwrights, they're gone. Um, so if you're going to um, expunge certain kinds of jobs, you have to create other better, let's say, uh, jobs for those people that aren't going to leave them just dangling out on a limb and feeling that something's been stolen from them. Mm. A question to all the panelists. Uh, where would you want to see Canada's money going? If, how, how are we going to put our money where our mouth is? How do we move from talk to action financially? Well, um, there's some pretty cheap things you can do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
We have a lot of ocean. Do we not? We do. We do indeed. Yeah, so three sides ocean. We could create a lot more um, marine reserves than we have, thereby increasing the number of fish, just for instance. And people in the fishing business already know this. And uh, by the way, the other thing that increases the amount of fish is increasing is, is protecting uh, seabirds. Um, protecting seabirds actually increases the number of fish. I can explain to you why, but it involves poop. <laughs> There's been some really um, cheap things like that that have an almost immediate financial benefit for people in those, those fields. Uh, but you're talking about what we do on the land. What mm -hmm. I saw in your video, by the way, was quite a few monocultures. Good point. Very good point. Stock footage is often criticized for, you know, being completely unrepresentative in many ways. <laughs> All the trees looked the same. And then we had these big lawns. <laughs> Car was driving through these lawns. What were they? Oh, uh, duly noted. Thank you. <laughs> Sheila? You know, yeah. I, I, I realized, I realized, uh, Adria, that I didn't quite answer your first question about imagination. And let me go back to, to that a little bit before I, uh, because it, it does link with what you're asking now. Mm. Um, when I was in Australia a few years back after my book came out, I was asked to go down to do some um, book festivals with a couple of other uh, Canadian authors. And Tim Flannery, one of the you know great climatologists, was there on the panel, and he was asked by an audience member, um, "What is lacking in our world that we're not taking urgent action as we need to, when we know that the science is strong and it's in?" And, and I would add, "Collaborated by Indigenous peoples who live on the ground and are tr the ground truthers of climate change." And his answer was, "What's lacking is imagination, imagining that we can do things differently, and imagining that we can create." Uh, a, a new way in which we do business, a, a new way to deal with one another, how to address these issues. And that struck a chord with me, you know, in, in the sense that it's not just dreaming up stuff and it's not inaction. Imagination leads to action. I, you know, we, how would we be living in this world today if we did not imagine what we live in today and the way in which, uh, you know, technology and all kinds of other things that, that have happened have been imagined by people. Um, and so for me, that, that really struck a chord because I think that is a way in which we can start to do things. Imagination isn't just a personal uh, way in which we can make changes. It can lead to different policy changes. And, the, and as I said a few minutes ago, the issue of the, the, the global negotiations on POPs, that's, that was possible to do because we started to get people to imagine themselves in the Inuit shoes, mm -hmm. in, in having your food poisoned, having your ice be going, uh, as that was, is your life force. All of these things of connecting people to what, that, that we are all very connected to one another in these terms um, is, in my opinion, a, the way to go. Um, and one of the other things that I wanted to mention as well is that, and it's imagination and, and trying to be innovative of how we can create more sustainable de uh, development uh, businesses in the Arctic instead of just one carrot that's being dangled in front of everybody up there, which is oil and gas and mining. Uh, and it is already happening with the Baffin Island area under the leadership of PJ Ajero and her, his lawyer, Sandra Inutik, um, Inuk, who's there and who is a lawyer, have been negotiating with the feds on creating conservation economies in the Arctic. Uh, we, we need to do more of that we need to think more about conservation economies and how that kind of culture match economy can be very helpful, not just to the Arctic, but for everyone else. When you protect, as I say, the Arctic, you save the planet. Mm -hmm. And so the, you know, the marine mammal that's there uh, in those areas on Baffin Island, I mean, let's explore those, those kinds of conservation economies much further than just dangling the one uh, way of developing the Arctic, which is going to just add more and more CO2 emissions to the environment 
and, and create even more havoc to a way of life of people who depend on their ice and depend on their food source and depend on that to develop those character building skills that our children so much need. And it's because of those kinds of disconnect that we are facing with our children today up there with the highest suicide rates in North America and the health problems, the education, all of those things are all very interconnected. And if we can again humanize those issues and bring them to all Canadians, I know that we can come together. And I'm, as I say, I'm more hopeful, hopeful because we live in that environment every day and we rely on it and it feeds us every single day with the, the most nutritious, delicious food ever. I'm very biased when it comes to that, but it's, it's really about that connection that we still maintain. And that is the hope that if people can learn and understand that better, um, then we can connect better and understand that we can, we can really come to more common ground. And I hope that, and I have hope that my children are going to grow up. I just read someone's note here saying that, you know, 13 year old daughter thinks that she's not going to live beyond 40 years of age. I mean, how sad is that when we come to that place, when our children at that young age are, being so bombarded with all of the, the, the negative things that are happening. Uh, and, and one of the things when I was involved in those ne global negotiations was to, to balance that with saying, yes, this is the way it is in terms of our food being poisoned, but it, the, the benefits much more far, far outweigh the risks. So we must continue to hunt. We must continue to eat this nutritious food as long as our nursing milk of our, our mothers, our expectant mothers are aware of what they shouldn't be eating while they're expecting and nursing. But at the same time, continue to live and continue to embrace this life in the future that I think holds for all of our children. And let's not worry our children to the point where they are already in, in this ho hopeless state when there's still so much hope. Imagine, I can't even imagine I mean, things that our ch my children and my grandchildren are going to innovate and create. We, none of us can, so, but we must be hopeful and we must be thoughtful and realize that there is a lot of re remarkable young people now thinking so differently from my generation. And they are the hope, the hope that gives us uh, this path way forward. Thank you, Sheila. By the way, we're coming to your house for some uh, for some traditional food after. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> uh, David, I, I'm going to uh, ceremoniously appoint you finance minister now. Um, where would you want to see Canada's money going? And I know this is. I mean, we're getting closer to to our, our last questions. And and um, after this, Adam's going to ask a final question of everyone. But if I could appoint you finance minister, and uh, you were to quickly determine where you know hundred billion dollars of stimulus spending could go uh, i mean it's not just that too we've got a 400 billion dollar pension that is currently funneling our money um, into a lot of coal companies and so on and our retirement money is is really funding uh, a four degree future um how would you want to see canada's money directed well uh first of all you know in, as an environmentalist we go to government or or even corporations begging for, for nickels and dimes, right? We need better public transit. We need, to, we need to insulate our homes. We need solar panels. And of course, governments are always restricted in terms of how much they've got. COVID crisis kit hits. Where the hell is all this money coming from? There don't seem to be any, what the hell is going on? And we're being told that action to deal with climate is uh, is we can't afford to do that, and yet for COVID nineteen, money suddenly pours out. So this whole idea that there are limits, I'd I'd say, you got to just open the tap. I don't know where it's coming from, but we got no choice but to spend what needs to be done. But let me tell you what the problem is. I've been uh, opposed the extraction of the uh, oil from the tar sands now for many many years. Four years ago. I get a call from one of the largest companies in the tar sands, Fort McMurray. Would, could I come and talk to you? I said, of course, I'm not into fighting. I would love to talk to you. Next day, he shows up, the CEO of this company shows up and I thanked him and said how honored I was and all that stuff. 
And I said, but I want you to do me one favor. Before you come in my office, I want to leave your identity as a CEO of an oil company outside the door. I want to meet you as one human being with another. Because I don't, I don't see the point of talking about uh, carbon taxes and pipelines and climate change and all of that if we don't begin with a point of total agreement. If we don't have any agreement, then we're, we're all over the place. So he was a good man. He, he, this is not what he expected, but he came in the door. And I, I said, thank you very much for doing that. Let me explain what I'm, I said, we live in a world that is shaped and constrained by laws of nature. And there's nothing we can do but live within them. Physics tells you, you can't build a rocket that will travel faster than the speed of light. We know that. Physics tells us that if I trip on the stair, I'm gonna fall and hit my head. The law of gravity. First and second law of thermodynamics say we can't build a perpetual motion machine. That is dictated to us by physics and we live within that. Chemistry, right. it's the same. The atomic property of the elements determines melting point, boiling point, freezing point, reaction rates, diffusion constants, all of that is set by what we know about the atomic properties. And that determines what kinds of, of molecules we can create and so on. And in biology, it's the same. I said, you and I were animals. And I could see right away, he did not like that. So, you know, I'm amazed that people don't like to, to call themselves, I mean, I was, I gave a talk in, at the, in Austin, Texas in the 1990s, first annual green building uh, meeting in Austin, Texas, 3000 people, a lot of kids in the audience. And I said, now kids, if you remember one thing from my lecture, remember we are animals. My God, did their parents get pissed off at me? This woman <laughs> came up and said, don't you call my daughter an animal, we're human beings. <coughs> I said, madam, I'm a biologist. If your daughter isn't an animal, she must be a plant because we <laughs> are biological creatures. I said, Mr. CEO, mm -hmm. what is the most important thing that every human being as an animal needs? And instead of giving me the answer, he went, well, uh, so I can see he's thinking of job, money. I said, listen, if you don't have air for three minutes, you're dead. If you have to breathe polluted air, you're sick. So would you agree with me that clean air is this gift from nature and that we have a responsibility to protect it because the air is, is in everybody and for all terrestrial creatures need that air. Right. So, so then I said, you and I, we're 60 to 70% water by weight. We're basically a big blob of water with enough thickener added. We don't dribble away on the, on the floor. But, you know, we leak water out of our skin and our eyes and our mouth and our crotch and we lose water. I said, Mr. CEO, if you don't have water for four to six days, you're dead. If you have to drink polluted water, you're sick. So clean water is like clean air. It's a gift from nature. And we have a responsibility to protect that. And I said, well, food is a little different. We can go a hell of a lot longer without food, but every bit of our food was once alive and four to six weeks without food will die. Polluted or contaminated food, we sicken. So clean soil and food joins clean water and clean air. And then I said, all of the, all of the energy in our bodies that we need to move and grow and work and reproduce, all of that is sunlight captured <coughs> by plants in photosynthesis converted into chemical energy, then we eat the plants or the animals that eat the plants, and we store that. When we need to do work, we burn those molecules and liberate the energy of the sun back out. I said, that's the fundamental foundation. The miracle of life on earth is that those things, earth, air, fire, and water are cleansed and replenished by the web of living things, mainly plants. I said, those are the basis for all people to live and live well. I said, other things, the economy, corporations, uh, uh, laws, um, the market, these are, not, these are not forces of nature, they're human constructs. We can change those things, but we can't change the fundamental laws of nature. I said, if you will shake hands with me and agree with me on that, then I will do everything I can to help you and your company.
So what do you just... think he did, Adrian? Did he? What do you think? <laughs> did he? Did he agree? Of course he couldn't. He if couldn't. he went back to his shareholders and said, I had a discussion with Suzuki and he's absolutely right. Our company must not uh, affect the air, water, or soil. He'd be fired in a second. <laughs> that's not his job. And that's the problem with the whole system. So when I hear, oh, can we afford to do this? Or what about the money for this? Or what about the jobs? I'm saying, wait, wait, wait. Let's start from a fundamental agreement, the foundation on which our lives and society are built. Then we'll invent ways of dealing, protecting those things and providing jobs and so on. They're the only things we can change. We Why can are corporations at the table? <laughs> We cannot eat money, right, Adam? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so let me just um, let, let me quickly wrap up. I know that everybody probably we've we've taken um, more than an hour of your time. So thank you to the panelists for uh, for that. And and I just want to quickly ask one thing to wrap. Um, as I mentioned before, I mean I think we can probably safely assume that most of the people here watching this are uh, people who take this issue seriously, who think that Canada should be taking action on climate. Uh, but I think we've probably also um, all of us, I think, have encountered, I certainly have, I'm sure all of us have encountered uh, people who, who don't necessarily deny that it's a problem, but they say, well, look, I mean, we're a pretty small country. Uh, Canada is, you know, sure, we're sure we're very, um, you know, large emitters by, uh, you know, per capita, if, if they know that. But, you know, if the, if the giants aren't moving on this, if China is still, uh, you know, building coal mines, et cetera, then why should we make sacrifices? We're not going to make or break this. Uh, and I think maybe to wrap, I'd like to know what your best counter argument is to that. So that uh, when, when the folks here who, uh, who are watching this, um, you know, encounter that next, um, they have their arms with the best possible response on it. Uh, so uh, Margaret, why don't we start with you on it? Well, there's a song by the arrogant worms called Canada's Really Big. And Canada's <laughs> in fact really big. So we have a lot of uh, marine territory we have a lot of land, we have a lot of forest, and we have a lot of Arctic. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big proportion of the planet. So that's, that's one thing we, we have to be looking at. Um, but I, I think what you're talking about is people saying, why me? You know, why should, why should we uh, make sacrifices? And I go back to the thing of, let's make it not a sacrifice. Let's make it a plus. Um, so there's that. There's also um, an, a nice thing that was in your, which was in the video, which was we could be a model. Um, and a society, a society is fairly small number of people, and therefore, apart from the distances involved, reasonably um, manageable. Um, you can be a template. So let's pretend it's a war. <laughs> Let's pretend it really is a crisis. Let's pretend it's a war. Um, in the war, which I lived through <laughs> as a small child, I'm really old, um, people volunteered, everybody pitched in, the whole economy was directed towards this effort, and it, it was a very unified country at, and during those years. So if it's a crisis, why can't we do that? Why can't we treat it like a crisis? Why can't we mobilize at the um, civilian level as has been done in the past? And you are actually seeing a lot of action locally. We talk about internationally and nationally, but when you go to the town and, and city level, you see, you see people saying they're gonna be carbon neutral. You see them making changes at the, at the city level. So if, if you could provide even for young people uh, or even for everybody, how can we volunteer? You know, is there a plan? If there were a plan directed towards this, how could we volunteer? Thank you. Uh, Sheila, to you, um, same question. Why Canada? Well, you know, when people say, um, you know, well, we're a small country and uh, it's a, the same excuse that people use on a daily basis. Why, why would I change my way of life? Uh, you know, my, I'm not going to make much of a difference. Uh, why would I stop, uh, you know, using so much fuel or 
whatever the excuses are, why would I stop my business when it's a successful one that's contributing to the economy? All of these things, you know, on a smaller scale, all add up. And so it's the same thing, you know, when Canada says, um, you know, we're a small country, we're just a drop in the bucket, you know, compared to the other big countries that are emitting, why would we have to? That's been the excuse of these COP meetings, you know, the international meetings all along, is that, um, you know, in, in, until Brazil and uh, India and China get on board, uh, you know, why, why would we be having to, you know, decrease our economies as a, a you know, for those kinds of excuses. But, you know, there, Canada has led before, and I bring back the same uh, issue that most people don't know much about these persistent organic pollutants. Canada has led the way before on the international level. That's a very big success story. Canada was the first uh, in, in these UN negotiations to sign, ratify, and enforce right on the spot with Minister Anderson at the time to be able to uh, have this come into law. And today, our, our air and atmosphere is safer. The country food of Inuit is safer as a result of that work. So Canada ca ca has been able to lead on the international scale before on major environmental issues that are related to the health of all Canadians and related to the health of all peoples of this world as a result of the, the work that we all did together. So it, it has been successful before and it can do so now on this issue of climate change. Well, thank you for that and for your, for your optimism in this discussion. Um, David, we'll wrap with you. Um, I saw you nodding as I asked this question, and I'm pretty sure that means you're, um, you, you're, you're, you're tired of, of running into this, um, this attitude over the years. Of, you've been working, many years you've been working um, to try to push for action. Um, so give us your best, um, your best quick counter argument when, this, when, when, you, when you're confronted with this. Well, the first one is that we have a, a moral obligation, it seems to me. Canada along with the rest of the industrialized world, have created the problem. It wasn't China, it wasn't India, it wasn't all of the small uh, countries that are struggling for a, a place in a global economy here. We were a big part of what took up all the space in the atmosphere. So it seems to me that uh, we have a responsibility then to, uh, to be a part of the, the solution, which is to reduce our emissions right there. But there's a more... <coughs> self-interested <clears throat> reason we are a northern country as Sheila is telling us we are heating in the in the north at three times the uh, global rate of heating we have the longest marine coastline of any country in the world sea level rise from warming is going to impact us more than uh, virtually any, any other country and then you think that our great boast is of natural systems, you know, whether they're polar bears or, or grizzly bears or our great forests, they are now being hammered by the change that's going on. British Columbia lost billions of dollars of, of pine trees because of an outbreak of the, uh, the, the pine, uh, mountain pine beetle that was suddenly no longer controlled because our winters weren't cold enough to keep them under control. We're being uh, heavily impacted by it. And if we, you know, we don't uh, show any action on our part, why should any other country give a damn that may, might not have as severe a problem? And I really think that uh, um, we uh, would have no right. And, and I was at Kyoto where the Alberta delegation was saying exactly that. We're just a small country and, and they were fighting for their uh, petrochemical industry, of course. And uh, they were saying it, it wasn't fair that India or China weren't involved when they were um, way bigger than, than we were. And we, and I, I felt at that time, we would have no right to tell India or China, don't do what we've already done. If we weren't showing that we were reducing uh, our, our emissions. So as a model, as a, anyone with a voice to the rest of the world, it seemed to me that we had to do the, the right thing. Can I take just a, a minute to conclude? I, I'm not an optimist, um, but I'm a realist, but I did live through a, a remarkable period on October 4th, 1957. Do you, anyone here know what happened on October 4th, 1957? 
Come on, Margaret, you're old enough to remember that. I, I am, but what was it? <laughs> 1957. Soviet Union launched Sputnik. So they did. Okay. And it was a shock. And, you know, we I didn't even know there was a space. I was in my last year in college in the United States. And every hour and a half, that satellite went over. <laughs> and the beep, beep, beep was like thumbing its nose at the U.S. And the Americans had three rockets, Army, Air Force, Navy. They launched each one separately. Everyone blew up. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the Russians launched the first animal in space, a dog, mm -hmm. Laika, the first man, Yuri Gagarin, mm -hmm. the first team of cosmonauts, the first spacewalk, the mm -hmm. first woman, Valentina Tereshkova. Mm -hmm. The America, I mean, it was really frightening. This was at the height of the Cold War. The, mm -hmm. the Russians seemed to be making inroads in Africa and Southeast Asia and South America. It was a really frightening time. And it was in the the Americans just said, we got to catch up and beat these guys. And they poured, here I am a Canadian in the States. And mm -hmm. all I had to do was say, I love science. And they poured money at us, set up departments of science in every university. They, they established NASA, poured money into NIH and NSF. And uh, then in 1962, Kennedy said, we choose to go to the moon. We're mm -hmm. going to get to the moon and back in a decade. And look at what happened. They didn't know in 1962 how the hell they were gonna do it, but they made the commitment to do it. Not only are they the only country to land humans on the moon and bring them back, but 60 years later, when Nobel prizes in science are announced, guess who still gets more than half of them? They're American scientists or scientists working in the United States because in 19, way back, in 1958, after the Russians, the Americans just said, we got to pour everything into catching up. Nobody said, we can't afford to, we can't afford it. It'll destroy the economy. Nobody said, oh, the Russians are so far advanced. Forget it. We've got other things to do. They just poured the money in and then made the commitment. And every year, the uh, NASA publishes a magazine called Spinoff, which are all literally hundreds of things that have spun off from that single commitment to get to the moon and back in a decade. And, you know, GPS, 24-hour uh, uh, news channels, uh, laptop computers, ear thermometers, space blankets. I mean, nobody had any idea what was going to happen. It all came because America said, we've got to get to the moon first. And I, I keep telling Americans, it's un-American to say it can't be done. It's too expensive. We can't do it. That's not the America I knew. And I think that we've got to seize the, uh, understand that once we seize the challenge as our highest priority, all kinds of things are going to happen. That's why I, I hate hearing, oh, well, we'll be able to create jobs here that we can pour money in here and it won't cost us. Forget all that. Make the commitment and magic will happen. I guarantee you things will happen that we had no idea were possible, but we've got to make the commitment and pour every effort into it. How would you formulate the goal as in getting to the moon and coming back? Well, the goal is given to us very simply by, by the IPCC. Reduce our emissions by, well, now 50% by 2030. And we've diddled away two of those 12 years that we had. We've got very little time. And our response to that is what? Government came back from Madrid in, in December of last year, and Jonathan Wilkinson announced net zero carbon by 2050. Oh boy, we're gonna be off fossil fuels by 2050. I wonder how many elections will there be between now and 2050? There are at least seven and probably more. And every government, new government that comes in, acts as if whatever the previous government did, we can throw that out and start over again. So that's been our history. How many politicians in office today will still be in office by 2050? Not one. So who's accountable? Who can we throw into jail for not meeting that target? No one. And so a commitment like that is an airy-fairy, nothing commitment, unless you put into place a plan and a mandate to start reducing reducing right now. It's not too late to run for prime minister, David, as we've seen south of the border. <laughs> <laughs> 
When Trudeau came back from Paris in 2015, <clears throat> he announced Canada was back. We had had nine and a half years of a prime minister who willfully ignored the reality of climate change by calling it crazy economics. No, Mr. Harper, it's the economics that's crazy. You're acting as if the economy comes before the atmosphere that gives us air to breathe, that gives us weather, climate, and the seasons. The economy's more important? Give me a break. We've, uh, we, uh, you know, so Trudeau came back and said, we've got to try to keep temperature close to one and a half degrees. I wrote him, emailed and said, are you serious? That's a hard target. He emailed me back and said, yes, I'm serious about that. And we celebrated. I wrote article after article saying, that's great. We're really, we're really on target. And then two years later, we buy a pipeline. And I say, what the hell is going on? So I said, I emailed him and said, Mr. Trudeau, why did you run for office? Are, wasn't it to be able to do something about a future that your children are going to live with? You have made an action now that will reverberate through your children's lives. And his answer to me is, he doesn't answer my letters anymore. That's how we <laughs> We'll answer them, David. Uh, we are have to thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I really would like you all to run the country, all three of you together. Maybe a, a trio, a uh, new form. We need a new style of leadership, really, in this country. And I, I and uh, <laughs> it would be beautiful to see. Thank you for your inspiration. I'm going to pass it over to Toby, who will wrap things up for us. Um, thanks, uh, David, Sheila, and and Margaret. I think uh, if the takeaways from tonight, are, the, the stakes are high. Canada is big, according to the arrogant worms and others as well. And if we don't get this right, a we, literally, we literally as a species will choke right. to death. David shared with us, we're not gonna get anywhere until we accept that we're, we're part of nature. We're, we're animals and we have a secret power called foresight, which gives us a chance to get out, maybe. Sheila shared with us, Change moves at the speed of trust, and it requires a lot of imagination. David also shared with us, you know, we can talk about the good things that will happen, but really this is about a mindset and a belief and about making a commitment. And if we do that, magic will happen. I mean, if the federal government prepares a once in a generation public investment in the spring budget to be issued probably in March, I hope that uh, David's words uh, rever reverberate, um, open the taps, and uh, and let's let's pour resources into this into the solution that uh, that so many people um, are committed to to achieving. So, thank you everyone for participating tonight. We will collate a lot of the great resources that were circulating in the comment board. We will post a recording, and we will keep the fight going forward with all this great grist from the mill from. Uh, David, Sheila, and Margaret, uh, really thank you kindly for participating and for everything you do. And uh, good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good to see Bye. you, David and Sheila. Bye. Thank Margaret, you. I'm going to call you. David. Are you? Have you got my number? Yep. Do you? I do. Not David. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have a talk. And Sheila, <laughs> anything we can do. Let me know. Thank you, Margaret. And if we can amplify that, let us know. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.